thank you for tuning in to Heal and Emerge Radio Broadcast. I am Quandrell Patterson. The messages for this month have been focused on thanks and giving as a way of living. This last week, we talked about stony ground. Before that, no, we talked about thorny ground. Before that, we talked about stony ground. And the first week of the month, we talked about wayside believers. Going through those different types of grounds, we used different examples from the Bible to drive home what those types of grounds look like. For the wayside, we read the scriptures from the parable that Jesus um, stated when he was talking about the parable of the sword. And then we actually read too later on in Matthew where Jesus explained those parables. We use disciples as an example for wayside um, believers who were along with Jesus for the miracles and for all of the the works that he did in the beginning. Jesus was breaking um, fish and loaves of bread that were enough to serve one person and he was feeding thousands of people with this one small meal or with a small portion. And the disciples were along for that, participated in that. But when Jesus was challenged after all of that, they still doubted and they still didn't believe. And they forgot the miracle that they were a part of. And we considered that wayside believers because although they were along for the ride and they were partaking in these miracles and actually being used to facilitate them, they didn't embrace that as the power of it as something that was miraculous and something that was connected to the power that Jesus had in him. And so that is described um, during this month. We've described it as people who receive the word and, and they know that it's real in that moment. And then they, but they don't protect it. They don't embrace it. They don't build on it so that they can develop a root. They just kind of leave it surface. And then when somebody comes and challenges it, they it, they just kind of let it go to the wayside. So those were wayside believers. Um, we did talk about how the disciples started out that way and that how it's possible that everybody starts out um, as a wayside believer. And the more they journey and the more experiences that they have and the more that they embrace the word, it grows. And Eventually, if they keep doing that, they will become good ground. The second week, we talked about stony ground. And the example that we used in stony ground were the children of Israel. The children of Israel um, enjoyed the presence of God. Um, God did everything for them. He protected them um, in Egypt. He protected them. From Pharaoh. He protected them during the plagues. He protected them all the time. He departed the Red, he parted the Red Sea for them to go through, and then he drowned Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army so the children of Israel could escape. They got into the wilderness and he was leading them through the wilderness. They were complaining about being hungry. He gave them um, quail and manna, which was equivalent to bread. And they still had complaints. All they kept thinking about was how great Egypt was. Or if we would have just stayed in Egypt and died, we would have been better off than we are in the wilderness. So that was a stony ground. Ground that um, enjoys a sustained relationship with God, but takes it for granted. Takes that relationship for granted. And when something happens that is against what they want, something happens that causes them a little bit of discomfort, then they start complaining as if, as if God owes them something, as they are entitled to um, something. And then they start complaining and being mad with God and saying, you should have just kept us in Egypt. You know, they always revert back to the bondage as being an actual uh, better place in life. And so that's that stony ground where 
they they can never really go forward and embrace the truth of who God is and what he's done in their life and, and his how awesome he is and reflecting on how how much he has done. They can never focus on that and move forward because they always looking back at a time in their life that was actually bad but but that they long for um, as they are in the place where they are uh, presently. So that's the stony ground. And then last week we talked about thorny. And when we talked about the thorny ground, we used as an example Judas. Judas, who was a disciple, who enjoyed the presence of Jesus. The He was among the miracles. He was among the disciples. He was a chosen one chosen to be close up on Jesus and to learn from him directly. And instead of him embracing that and using that as an opportunity, he allowed something to rise up in him, a a care of this life, which is thorny ground that made him jealous of Jesus, that made him want to destroy Jesus, that made him, uh, think it not evil to turn Jesus over to people who wanted to destroy him. Why? For, for silver, for money. And he was greedy and he wanted power and he was jealous. He had all of these things going on. And these things were thorns in his life that kept him from, uh, in, from letting the word grow in him. It choked the word out of his life. It suffocated the word out of his life. And when those things, greed, power, jealousy, um, envy, when those things started to choke the word out of his life, it created a space for Satan to get in and to drive him to doing evil. And that was the thorny ground that we talked about last week. This week, we are going to talk about good ground. And when we talk about good ground, this is the ground that we all hope to accomplish and achieve. And even if we haven't accomplished it, we hope, we, we strive for that. We are always working towards becoming that good ground. This is the ground that receives the word and they understand it and then they perform it. And then they bear fruit of it. So that good ground is the ground that we're going to talk about this week. And as we talk about it, we are going to use King David as our example for good ground. And as we talk about David, you're going to see that God initially saw David as good. And and we're going to react what God had to say about David, the the compliment that God gave him. And we're going to see how good ground, remember our thoughts are not God's thoughts and our ways aren't God's ways. We're going to see how God saw David as good and things that David went through and how um, God, what God saw was what he saw, but it, it, it doesn't look how we think it should look. And we'll get a little bit deeper into that and it'll start to make more sense as we read God's word. So let's go ahead and get into our foundation scripture. Um, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 11. God is speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord, or your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and work and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. 
So again, we're going to look at David tonight and we're going to look at how David made many mistakes. He had a blind spot. He got off track, but God did not judge him according to his deed. God judged him according to his heart. And we're going to see a demonstration about how God um, knows the heart of a person. And we'll probably look at different examples of that, but David is a perfect example of good ground and a perfect example of when we get off track. It's not that we got off track. It's do we quickly get back on track? And that's, that is a, a testament to your ground. If you get off track and it's brought to your attention because you had a blind spot for a season or however long, you can get back on track. You can look in the mirror when somebody shows you yourself. You can say, ouch, that's me. And you can repent and you can get back on track. That's good ground. Good ground wants to be better. Good ground does things probably sometimes that get off track. But when it is revealed to them that you are off track and you need to get back on track just stop, take a breath, you off track. Good ground says, oh man, how in the world did that happen? You know, and then they get back on track. That wayside and that stony and that thorny. The heart ain't right in in the in the stony and the thorny ground. On the wayside ground, I think it's just a matter of maturity. But stony and thorny, there's a heart condition there that's causing people not to see properly. So these are the differences and some of the characteristics of these grounds. But that good ground has a good heart. So even if they are deceived or off track or somehow found themselves over somewhere where they shouldn't be it's it's easy for them to come back because their heart is right so uh keep that in mind as we talk about the word for tonight that god's thoughts and god's ways are not our thoughts and our ways and we will see a demonstration of that with king david our prayer is the lord's prayer our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When you, when you walk out in life, are your feet leading you into temptation or are your feet leading you into doing doing good doing well as a default are you constantly having to bring yourself back into center or to center from a direction of doing evil or are you are you constantly try, having to bring yourself back to center from a direction of well you wouldn't have to bring yourself back if you're doing good so what is the default what is the default? Are you are you living in on the good, you know, walking in a good direction and from time to time you you find yourself off track or are you constantly off track? And getting back to center trying to go in the good direction is a struggle for you. That's a question that I just want you to think about um while we're doing it because when it says lead us not into temptation in that um prayer Lord's prayer uh, God doesn't do that. When we are going into temptation, if we keep our eyes focused on him, it, it keeps us centered. And so if you find yourself just out there going in a direction that's, that's walking you right up into stuff that's not good for you, into stuff you can't be proud of, then ask God to help you with that. Deliver you from the evil one keep you from being tempted and 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 when you are tempted to succumb to that temptation ask God to keep you from succumbing to temptation and deliver you from that evil one in Jesus name amen so now we're gonna go into the parable and the parable again this is the last ground so this is the very last um verse 
of the parable comes from Matthew 13. And for good ground, it's Matthew 13, verse 8. And this is talking about the ground. And then we'll read verse 23, where it's actually explaining the ground. So Matthew 13 says, But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That was what Jesus said in sowing the seed. I mean, in talking about the parable of the sower. Now, when he explained it in verse 23 of Matthew 13, he says, this is what it means. But he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produce some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. He who receives it, that's the first step for good ground. You have to receive the word. When the word is coming forth, you have to receive it. You can't be fighting it. You can't be like, oh, here we go again. You can't have a bad, nonchalant attitude towards it. You have to receive it. Receive it with gladness. You have to receive it. And then once you receive it, you have to process it. You have to hear it. How does it apply to my life? Is there an area in my life that this word is searching for, trying to cleanse? And then you have to understand it. Okay, if it is searching for an area, how do, how do I apply it to that area? How, how do I um, let it work in my life? What are the steps that I need to take to do that? You have to receive it. You have to hear it. You have to understand it. And then you bear fruit. So once you receive it and then you hear it, let it search you and find, oh, there it is right there. It's that mind thing that you got going on. You keep you keep thinking about what's wrong instead of what's right. That's where I want to work on you right there. That's what this word want to work on. So then you received it. You said, okay, I, I, I received what's being said. Where does it impact my life? God might say it, it impacts you in your, in your thoughts, in your mind. And then you say, okay, now I hear that. I hear it. I've received it. Now I hear it. How do I understand it? And God may say, um, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Bring all those thoughts into captivity that are against the knowledge of Christ. Make them obedient to the word. Start putting the word up. And, you know, all around, stay in the word, stay in the word, feed yourself a steady diet of the word. And as you do that, your mind is going to change. Those thoughts are going to be less and less regular until you'll be trying to think, I don't have those thoughts anymore. And that will be you understanding the word and then bearing fruit. You want to do that consistently and you want to do that in every other, your every area of my life. Um, it's your mind, it could be your tongue. Maybe you tell a lot of lies and you don't understand why you tell a lot of lies. And you be like, ah, that word hit me. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, I have to have a relationship with things that are true. I can't be fearful. It could be fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. This fear in me keeps me from acknowledging what's true because if I acknowledge what's true and I can't do nothing about it, then that scares me. And I don't want to be scared. So I just keep telling lies. So this just me giving like different examples of how you want to use the word to find these areas of your life so that you can be better. That's good ground. That's that's the process that's how good ground processes the word. We're going to give you an example of that with King David. So first we want to see how God saw David. And this is in Acts 13 um, verses, we're going to start with 22 and 23. Now, God had just um, pretty much got tired of Saul because he was just a king who was acting up and doing everything but what he was supposed to do and serving everybody but who but God. And so God just had got tired of him. So in verse 22 we see, and when God had removed him that he raised up for them King David as king, or David as king, whom he had um, testimony about David. He said, I have found 
David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do my will. For this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus, from his seed. So David, through the lineage of David, Jesus was born. And this is what God said before um, David started doing the things that we're going to read about that is going to show you um, how God processes good ground. Okay, so we find David's story in 2 Samuel 11. Now, in 2 Samuel 11, uh, David, this it was a time of year. Spring is what um, 2 Samuel is saying. And this is when it um, David would send people out to war, or kings would. And it happened that David had arose after he had sent his, his men off to battle, and he saw Bathsheba, who is Uriah's wife, bathing outside. And he sent uh, his men down to find out who she was. He found out she was Uriah's wife, which is one of David's um, people who are out there in the battle. That did not stop David from pursuing uh, Bathsheba and calling her up so that he could sleep with her. So he called her up. He slept with her. She got pregnant. Now, it couldn't be Uriah's wife. Now, they out at war. So war, as we know, lasts a little while. It ain't no... That we we gone today and tomorrow we back home. It's it takes months and sometimes years, and so Uriah was gonna be out for a minute. So Bathsheba's pregnancy would be unexplained. David, when he found out that she was pregnant, he called for Uriah to come back from war, and he wanted Uriah to go and lay with Bathsheba, his wife, and. He sent a, a big meal, you know, he's kind of like set the tone for romance um, for them. But Uriah did not go and lay with her. He was the type of guy who was like, why am I getting special privilege? If all of my people uh, who are in battle with me can't go and be with their wife, it feels weird to me. It feels strange that I would be allowed to go. And so he didn't want that special privilege. He wanted to be... Um, in the battle, he was all about being in the battle. He was a, a leader and he was a good soldier. So he was like, Nope, I'm not going to do that. And then David found out that he didn't go and then was asking him, why didn't you go? And he came back. This is, um, verse 11. And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I am not doing this. So he was like, nope, that's, that, I don't, that's not how I get down, pretty much. I don't, I don't do that. So I'll go when everybody can go. Now, when David heard this, he told him, Okay, just wait until tomorrow, and then I'll let you depart. Let him go back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next day. Now David called him. He ate and he drank before him, and David made him drunk. And at the evening, he went out to lie in the bed of his servants of his Lord, but he did not go to his house. So David, after that, decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him drunk, and then he'll go and lay with his wife. And when that didn't happen, in the morning, this is Second uh, Samuel 11, verse 14. In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab, who was over Uriah in battle, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. So David got tried to get him, well, got him drunk. He still didn't go. Then he told him to, de to deliver to Uriah the letter that was, I mean, to deliver to Joab the letter that, what that David was using to tell Joab to kill Uriah. So Uriah delivered his death note to Joab. And this is David doing it. So this is very, very kind and very manipulative um, things that David was doing. Very not good things. And um, so in the letter, he said, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him. So put him up in, in the midst of where, where everything is happening where stuff is popping off and then leave him out there that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city 
that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew that there were valiant men, meaning strong men, where he was going to die. If he went in there, that's just like going going into a place where you know it's, it's a zone where, it's, where, where, where bullets are flying. And you know if you go through there, I mean, the chances of you not making it through is pretty high. That's where um, Joab sent Uriah. Then the men of the city came and fought with Joab, and some of the people and the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite was among them. So Uriah ended up dying as a result of that. And then um, they came back and they told David that he was dead. And what did David do? Then he told them to, to strengthen up their uh, attacks and go and defeat them. So they could have de- they could have defeated them the whole time, but they did not fight as strong as they should have or could have because David had told them to pretty much set it up to where Uriah wouldn't make it back from this battle. When the wife of Uriah had heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. This is verse 26. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became David's wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Remember, this is David. This is good ground. This is who God said is a man after my own heart. This is David. So this is what David did. Now, what did God do in response to that? God sent a prophet because he like David done got off track. David can't even see. He done been blinded by lust. We sin when we are drawn away by our own lust and enticed enticed away from from the truth of, of of how things are and then once we are drawn away that lust con- is conceived and when it conceives it brings forth sin and then sin brings forth death so we're going to see this play out so then the lord sent and this is second samuel 12 then the lord sent nathan to david And he came to him and said, there were two men, one city in one city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except for one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank of its own cup and lay in his own bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock. This rich man wouldn't, didn't want to get none of his flock and from his own herd to prepare for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had came. So a man came in to the, to the rich man's house. And instead of the rich man taking from his flock, all of the flock that he had to feed this man, he took, He took the lamb that the poor man had. So this is um, Nathan giving the the parable of David taking Uriah's wife. Of all the wives that David had, he wanted Uriah's wife. So David, after hearing this, was greatly aroused with anger. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity David talking about himself in this then Nathan said to David you are the man you are the man and when David realized that he was the man he said I have sinned against the Lord and as soon as he had acknowledged that he had sinned and he was sorrowful and repented the Lord had also put away David's sin. So God forgave him immediately. There was a consequence to the sin. The child that um, David and Bathsheba had together ended up dying. And when the child died, as long as the child was sick, David was pleading with God to, to save him. He fasted. He went day and night. He didn't eat. He stopped eating. He started praying for his child to live. And when the child didn't live, David went right back into pleasing God and serving God. So David was good ground, but you see the order of things with David. He saw himself, what he did wrong, 
He repented and God forgave him, but he went a long time in this lust. So good ground don't mean you're perfect. It just means when when you are when your sin is revealed, you acknowledge it. 